so got rid of some assets. So net worth stayed the same. You don't have a 401k? You never did? What? Did you, did you ever have a 401k? Or you never oh, yeah. And, and yeah. It's, I guess there were 403 for the nonprofit. Oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> and there's 401k, the 401a, there's the whole alphabet. <laughs> and the independent businesses, I was a consultant, a vendor of services to the Minneapolis Fed for 20 years. Yeah. And they, before becoming an employee, the last 10. Um, and they, so that was, a, you have a, they call it, there's a, some pension funds are all varieties. Uh, you, there, there's so many of them, but the, the businesses can put up to 20% of your salary, up to about 40,000 total. Um, 45,000, I guess it's up to now. In this deferred Thank compensation, the, oh. the deferred receipt, receipt of the income and payment of the tax, when it comes out, that's when you do it. When you pay. <laughs> How do they treat the taxes on retirement here? Uh, well, actually, actually, right now, what what we have is that um, the, the private pension system. Uh, you can. Well, well, there's there's one portion which is compulsory, obviously, uh, which is you know similar to the. We, we used to have, there is, there, there are two systems. There's the yeah. benefits, and there's the, um, the, um, the, uh, defined contribution. Contribu um, are so defined benefits and defined yeah, contribution, the right? Is similar to the social security in the yeah. US, more or less. Oh, yeah. Um, there's there are defined people benefits. Still, there are some people who are still up to that, but the other half of the, of the population is. By the way, so they benefits. made a big change in the US back in the early 80s. And start taxing Social Security benefits, okay. which effectively reduced them right. for those who had saved for retirement. Right. Now here, here we have um, a figure where it, you know it's compulsory, but you don't. In the end, you end up receiving your money uh, as it goes. Um, so you know if you you're contributing to the defined contribution system, uh, your your um, returns. At the time that you retire, they just come in as, as, as they are. Oh, you don't, it's not part of your taxable income. And, and there's also a, volunt a voluntary system. You, you, can, you can contribute um, at, at the most, there's a, there's a cap like of 30% of, uh, of your income, of your, you know, your yes. salary um, that is uh, that it's tax deductible. So you don't, need, you, you don't actually pay taxes on yes. that. Uh, if you take your money out before five years, you lose your tax benefit and you have to pay it out. But if you don't, you you, you gain your the, the, the deduction of on your taxes. And in the end, it's, it's actually very good. But okay. obviously, they're planning and changing a lot of those things because <laughs> <laughs> they're figuring out. Actually speaking, they're not that uh, great. Okay. Um, so uh, we're here with um, uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner 2004. Dr. Edward Prescott, thank you very much, and welcome to Colombia. This is your first time in Colombia? This is my second time, my second time. Okay. and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, so I'm actually going to ask you a very easy question because apparently not, not a lot of people are, are, are so much aware of this. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your economic crisis, your novel economic crisis? What were the, the, uh, the, the uh, contributions that you made that, that made you uh, a winner of the, of the economics prize. It, it's joint work with Finn Kittlin. Yeah. Uh, uh, there were two papers. Paper one is the something about time inconsistency of the optimal policies. That means you have to have a technology of committing. You can't do what's best given the current situation. You have to set what the, the plan, if you can commit, you can do better. Um, that meant that macroeconomic policy was not a matter of like control theory, controlling the rocket ship to the moon or something. Uh, instead, it's a game. We're dealing with people. <laughs> and people 
what they do now depends upon what they think is going to happen. And, and then very simple. The second thing, and more important contribution, was the uh, the methodology. That we happen to apply it to business cycles. Uh, how to construct explicit, <laughs> dynamic, make general equilibrium models with people in there making transactions, saving, uh, deciding how much, what contracts to enter into. Anytime there's a contract, there's somebody on both sides. Uh, that it's a radically different than the partial equilibrium. We don't use the word supply and demand except as a mathematical abstraction to prove existence of the uh, equilibrium in these. But they're not, what we organize our knowledge around is people's ability and willingness to substitute uh, between, well, consumption today and in the future, or between labor and leisure, uh, consumption and non-market time. Uh, you can put more of your time in the market have more income and buy more consumption. And the tax on income, on labor income, I should say, um, makes um, market goods more expensive relative to the ability to kind of need to transform. So that with this whole methodology, it's totally dominated. Dynamic economic theory became a hard science. We, it includes financing. The equity premium puzzle paper is a widely cited one that I had written with Ragnish. Equity premium puzzle, yeah, uh, with Ragnish Mara. Um, but that says, we started saying how big things are. And we make welfare statements about what happens if you change the, the tax the ta tax system in a certain way, what is the consequences for the welfare how, of the individual as measured in their lifetime consumption equivalents? That uh, how much we have to have your income scaled up by to make you indifferent to the change? That's the measure. Um, so we and there are some puzzles, but they a lot of them get. That, that's true of any hard science like physics or economics. So. Actually, I was I was going to ask you about that. Um, last year we um, we had here we invited uh, another of your colleagues, uh, another economic prize winner, um, Robert Merton. Um, and it's it's actually very interesting to you know to talk to to people like you because um, the economic sciences, um, especially with the with the financial crisis of two thousand eight and two thousand nine. A lot of economists are having a little bit of a, maybe I should say, kind of mind change of real or realization of different theories that maybe were not really there or were or were maybe part of the past, and they actually came back to reality with uh, with the, 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 the financial crisis. How, how do you think uh, that you know your your theories well, come along with? Oh, I think the, the theory, established theory we know. Uh, Politicians ignore theory. Uh, politics thumps science. You know, what they do to Galileo, Inquisition. <laughs> he says he, the, world, the uh, Earth is not the center, and the Sun is the center. The and uh, this is. Uh, Sort of that going back to a totally failed and discarded theory, like a stimulus. A stimulus spending more is depressing. That's an established scientific fact. Um, there's no question about that. Neither empirical nor and theoretical says otherwise. Oh, it's been yeah, that, that that depresses. So. <laughs> So, and then what did they do? That poor little Christine Romer had to contradict her own research because she's put there to defend some politician's uh, plan. And they say, here's what you're supposed to say. She's given two weeks. Uh, but that's not fair to somebody. Uh, 
the, they're not there as a, the role of the economists and the government is to give some you know, sort of private counsel to the politicians and what make them understand what the trade-offs are. And they face some really difficult problems with the political realities. Uh, and good administrators make a lot of difference. So from what you're saying, uh, there's, there's a, I have a sense that um, you feel like politicians have a, a lot to, to respond to this. To this right. I mean, they're responsible. You yeah, look at what the young people are doing. And it's the Kidlin and Prescott methodology has dominated. Um, somebody, anytime you have a serious conference where they have explicit general equilibrium models, everybody always finds the same thing. Uh, it's true that if you read some of these papers uh, and you look at their model, you look at their introduction, they say they found something different. Then you look at their model and listen to what their model, explicit, fully articulated artificial economy, to which they're studying the behavior of to build their economic intuition, they all say the same things. There's some of these neo-Keynesian people. The reason the U.S. economy is depressed, they say, is people caught a contagious case of uh, laziness. <laughs> ah, that's not it. Uh, these people are working, <laughs> want to work, and uh, the problem is it's not in the interest of parties to, given the uncertainty, to enter into these mutually, em these employment contracts. You don't want to make a big, inf enter into an employment contract with uh, somebody and then make a big investment and then they're gone. <laughs> or it's, we now understand the depressions, that that things, there were some puzzles about why people were working, why the economy was booming so much in the late 1990s in the U.S. Um, in fact, in the, at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, it, when advising the president uh, for the ten, who attended the open market committees and voted sometimes, um, the puzzle was why were people working so much? Did they get a contagious case of workaholism, or I guess Keynes would call it animal spirits, uh, the answer is no. And, and it was an unusual period because normally when output's high relative to the trend, two-thirds of it is people work more hours, and one-third is they get more output per hour. In that one, 125% was people working more and minus 25% was output per hour. Normally in a boom, corporate profits are big. They were really low then. What was going on? Well, McGratton, Ellen McGratton and I, uh, I talk about this puzzle in my Nobel address, and since then we've resolved the puzzle. It's unmeasured investment that gets expensed. In fact, the boom in the late 90s was even bigger all this unmeasured stuff, the high-tech stuff, when you start up a new business, you put a lot of sweat equity in there and the owners... Research and development. You are, that's a big chunk and we have some measures of that. And research and development in that period went way, way up much more in percentage terms. Basically it had to be, it was sort of technology driven. It was the engineers that were responsible for it for this big boom, the high-tech boom. Uh, of course, you can sit back and pray for another boom like that if you're a politician. Uh, that saved Clinton. Yeah, they probably need that, right? <laughs> no, I mean, you set up good, the boom in the 80s was the tax cut boom in the U.S. Uh, that big boom in the early 60s, that was technology. Jet airplanes, <laughs> mainframe computers, the interstate highway system in the U.S., the chemicals made incredible progress. Uh, and so this is, uh, the key factors are, if you tell me what the productivity is, which is, you measure the inputs and you measure the outputs, and 
if you get more output per unit of inputs of composite, then productivity is higher. Treating that as exogenous, it depends upon laws and regulations as well as that exceptional cases where there's waves of innovation. That tells you what the economy, you can predict well what the path of the economy. The observations are in remarkable conformity with the predictions of theory. Um, theory works and it's, you know, in the financial thing, people find out, find ways fast when, uh, in 1981, mortgage markets in the U.S. shut down. A tenured professor putting a third down, I couldn't get a mortgage. Just when I moved from Pittsburgh to M Minneapolis. So I had to, so we had to go to individual financing, not intermediated. I issued a mortgage in Pittsburgh, and the people that sold me the house in Minneapolis issued a mortgage to me. Uh, it's, it's, and we saved a lot of money on uh, intermediation costs, but we bore a lot of idiosyncratic risk, which which didn't, with no problems developed. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket uh, on risky th things. Uh, and sometimes with the mortgage market, uh, you want to diversify across a lot of both regional and uh, individuals. You know, individuals have marital problems or something and they forget about paying mortgages. Um, and that's when the, that's a big default risk. Is what I learned at that time. What's your what's your view on the um, on the recovery, or say so, the the recovery of the U.S. economy right now? Yeah, I say know, there's no recovery. Oh, I say we're still. If the last quarter we actually f fell a little bit relative to trend. Mm -hmm. I do it relative to trend, which is growing. About three percent. Almost three percent. It's a little bit population growth has slowed in the United States. Um, people are going back to Mexico. <laughs> the flow is, there was a million net foreign people coming in from uh, uh, foreign born a year. And that's down to zero now. So that one million out of 320 million people, that's, that's a drop of a third of a percent in the population growth rate. So I might be might be closer to 2.6 now, <laughs> rather than 3%. Um, but that 1% population growth had been pretty constant over a very, very long period of time. So the 3% number you gave, Maybe at least know. until recently, has been a, the number. <laughs> what do you think are the problems on this? path to try to recover, or do you, th for example, when it comes to monetary policy and to well, The greatest policy, thing to happen is this, not monetary policy, people using the methodology, they build in tax rigidity, I mean, uh, contracting rigidities, um, staggered wage contracting, sticky prices, Calvo, uh, and these factors quantitatively don't, when they're restricted by micro-observations, don't seem to show up as being important. That's the finding of this. Some things, it's, I, if you see big deviations, if you abstract from these factors and you saw big deviations when there were financial crises, then I would point, look for that, model that, incorporate that in a good way. But there's not. It seems to be all the taxes, and more important, the productivity, is what determines the level of outcome. There are extreme cases when Brazil had their 40 and 50 percent, a huge inflation, and 11 percent of their GDP was used up in the banking. They could clear checks in well, they used to have a nanoseconds. They used to have a thousand percent. What? They used to have a thousand percent. A thousand, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It, but that's socially wasteful, having all the people doing that activity. Yes. You want them out there producing things that people value, and, and the reasonably stable price system is a, 
the function of the uh, Federal Reserve System. Also, you want a, a safe payment, an efficient payment and credit system uh, that facilitates exchange. Uh, and our financial system has been getting better in the U.S. Uh, it's, it's so we, it, the markets are so liquid, and it used to be they charge a couple two percent on a brokerage commission. Now it's zero. With this exchange, it's easy to get divert. It used to be the mutual funds were two percent, counting the load of, up front. Um, amortized over the life of the holding. Now, 10 basis points, it's easy to get through somebody like the, I guess, the federal thrift plan. It's about two basis points. But the standard is more, it's easy to get it under 10 basis points through places like Vanguard, for example, and Fidelity and others. So. It, and it's so fast you can do these uh, these transactions uh, to move the money around, and, it's, and you can get diversification of idiosyncratic risk, things that average out. Uh, one of the principles, by the way, about finance, uh, non-idiosyncratic risk, aggregate risk cannot be diversified away. It's non-diversifiable. Somebody has to bear it. And we got to set up good mutual sharing arrangements to handle that. We have a lot of good ones. The stock market's a good one. Mutual funds are good ones. Um, well, insurance companies work quite well. Um, if you try to insure the uninsurable, you can get into trouble. And, then these people come to the tax to the government to say bail out the lender bar, bail out the lenders to these institutions and there's a lot of hidden taxes which is that's not good so so I think the over in Europe I think the the most guilty parties are people like the Germans and the French they should not have lent to Greeks <laughs> and the people who lent to the were on the subprime mortgages should not have, but the government mandated that by law to do it. In some, the banks had to invest locally, and in that even if there were not qualified borrowers locally, it's this is uh, some. I think we should have some fairly fundamental financial reform. There's going to be another crisis soon. God, so the, that, the so whole system is so designed. We, well, I mean, obviously, we can't predict the future, but uh, you just said we're going to have a financial crisis soon. Yeah, it's Wait. because it's tied in with, up with the political thing. The politicians want to use this to hidden subsidies to groups that support them, their coalition. Um, and you get too big to fail. That's tied in with that time inconsistency yeah. problem I talked about at the beginning. Um, and if you get too big to fail, then you can borrow at a lower rate. Uh, Got to do something to. Um, I go to the extreme of saying very narrow banking, 100% reserves for all transaction demand deposits and do everything else mutual. Rule out financial or institutions that both borrow and lend. Borrow from one and lend to another and live off the spread. Because they'll borrow short at a low interest rate and lend long at a high. Those assets can get into trouble. And then they're insolvent. And then you, then what do they do? You, you can't let this institution go bankrupt. Think of all those poor lenders, depositors. The government bails us out, comes out of the taxpayer's pocket. Do you think the, the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, 
and in Europe. Just comparing the both of them, the both, your, both, both central banks, yeah. do you think they have much more to do right now, given what's what's going on, or do you think they they've done so far a good job and and they're you know they're not supposed to well, do anything more? In the U.S., we used to have a lot of inflation, but throughout much of the world, the amount of inflation comes down. That indicates the central banks are doing a better job. You say now, <laughs> which was a good question. Uh, I think they're doing some, you know, borrowing short reserves, uh, borrowing from the banks, and lending somewhat longer at a higher rate. They're making huge profits, the Federal Reserve System, but they're gambling. And I don't think they should be in that business of gambling. They're, they're there as just an efficient payment and credit system and maintain the stable prices. The, that really facilitates when you're plan, a business person en entering into contracts with various parties. If you have, you don't have to worry about guessing what's going to be happening to the uh, inflation rate or going through complicated hedging procedures that may not be solvent themselves. Mm -hmm. They create the fiction of this non-diversifiable risk going away by packaging these mortgages and breaking them up into trenches and all kinds of mumbo-jumbo <laughs> that gets complicated. Uh, if you're in that field, you probably know it. I, the details better than I. Right, right. <laughs> it seems that nobody understands it. <laughs> uh, I think of the sort of the macro, the overall. It, you can't just look at one little part of the thing, you have to look at the whole. And we've got to increase the opportunities for people to save, and we can do that by tax reforms and by. Uh, it, it, not just paying people to retire early, uh, to getting, not to paying people to get out of the labor market. It's in providing incentives that if you put more, work more and put more in there, you get more out when you retire. If you go to this mandatory 10% like Australia, that would, if the U.S. did that, that would reduce poverty uh, in the U.S. The, they require you to annuitize it when you retire in Australia. Sweden's adopted a similar system. But the thing is, in the U.S., about the retirement part is 10.4 percent. They split between the employer and employee contributions. It's a little bit lower now because of the temporary reduction in the, they call it the payroll tax. Um, now that money would put in the individual accounts and, and I don't think, and, and say get a 4% real, these people would have the median wage earner would have a lot more some payments would be a lot bigger than they are under Social Security and they would enjoy have a better retirement period. And they'd have incentives to work longer too, or get a second job, or sometimes keep it busy. As I like that, but it's, it's and a lot of people seem happier when they are busy. What about in Europe? <laughs> what, what about in Europe? In Europe, I think they are making some reforms. Uh, that they're the Swedes followed the Australians. Uh, the Swedes. Uh, have indexed the retirement age. They've upped the retirement age to the mortality tables. Um, Central Europe is doing pretty well. And, but it's sort of, what is it, they have their political, uh, well, some, I don't know why they don't just let some Greece go bankrupt. Uh, uh, or when New York got into trouble in the seven, 1970s, uh, I guess the, the teachers' unions bailed them out, huh? and they survived. Uh, of course, they had an interest in that. 
um, to do that. And let California and Illinois go bankrupt. <laughs> a lot of states in the U.S. are doing well. There's a big variation in how well different states are doing. And it seems to be all tied in with the expenditures and regulations. So it's, fun, it's funny that you mention uh, that you don't understand why they don't let Greece go bankrupt. Um, but then the question is, well, right now, you know, the European crisis kind of during the first quarter of this year kind of stabilized because of the, of the, the long-term uh, refinancing operations of the European Central Bank. Uh, but then in the past few weeks, there's been, again, concern, but more, more focus on Spain. Spain. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a very valid concern that eventually Spain will also need some sort of a, of, a, of a rescue package similar to the ones that Greece and Ireland and Portugal have, have needed. So the question is, if, assuming that Spain goes through that, through that path, because you know, the economic situation in Spain is really, really, really poor, um, do you think Spain should be let go? Or? We have a little history. Tom Sargent, who got the Nobel Prize this year, in his Nobel address, he looked at what the U.S. had done when the states were going bankrupt. Um, the, the, what they all went bankrupt. Many went bankrupt. And as serious as the European problems are today, in the 1840s, the federal government did not bail them out, and it was minor, real consequences. If a lot of big corporations go bankrupt. Um, whole industries go bankrupt. The steel industry, with the exception of U.S. Steel, and the U.S. went bankrupt. Uh, airlines, of course, go bankrupt <laughs> periodically. That's endemic. But the automobile manufacturers all went. The domestic ones went bankrupt. The foreign ones are doing quite well uh, in the United States. Because the foreigners are investing in the United States, and the U.S. is investing abroad. Uh, so I don't think there would be a big disaster if uh, a few states that's a, to have that market judging the uh, states and whether or not they're behaving physically responsible is a good discipline. And to have you know the German government tell their old people. Well, you put the money in the banks, and then they tell the banks, you lend it to the Greeks. We, we, don't worry, we'll take care of the uh, bailing them out. Uh, old people vote, and they want a place to save. But, but it's, it's a bad promise to make. But it seems that, I mean, you were, you were saying a few things that happened you know, many years ago. Um, but then, you know, the, 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 the counter argument would be, well, the thing is that, you know, 30, 50, 100 years ago, uh, the interconnection of the of the world economy was much, much less than what it is today. So, you know, at that time, if the state of New York would go bankrupt, there's a situation that goes on with New York, and that's it. But today, the, the, you know, the whole issue is that, you know, last year or two years ago, when Greece was going to, about to go to the fault, the whole world was under eyes on Greece because there was a big concern that if Greece went down, then the whole world economy will also go down because of a small country like Greece. I guess you know because of the interconnection of yeah. I don't see the inter I don't see the me people try to develop mechanisms for this to to happen. Um, the United States was a reasonably integrated economy in 1840. They had to build the canals and the, they had railroads. Uh, you know, 50 years before that, it was not. Transportation costs were too big. Um, it was not, but the whole U.S. did not go down. At that time, the, the, the reforms were, at the state level, were man made. Every state, for, was save one, passed constitutional amendments requiring a balanced budget. Sometimes they get sneaky ways to get around that. Good accountants can do just about anything, or clever accountants. Um, so I don't see why the whole world would go down. I think that was just uh, 
they did not want their banks, German banks would be in problems. It would be embarrassment for the German government. The German government would then uh, wouldn't get reelected. Japan, they had a financial crisis in about 1992. Um, a lot of their borrowers uh, from the banks couldn't make the interest rate payments. So what they do? The government and the, the banking industrial, banking government complex uh, had the banks lend to the borrowers so they could pay the interest so they wouldn't have to declare a bad debt. And Japan lost a decade of growth. It's only when that guy came in there and really did the fun, that fundamental reforms that Japan again began to grow a trend. Uh, actually, even recovered a little bit. Japan's not doing that badly now. People think it is, but their working age population is shrinking. They have a huge uh, demographic bul bulge of people that are about ready to move into saving. They've invested a huge amount abroad, so their, their balance of payments are going to go negative in the near future uh, as these t temporarily just run down their lending abroad. But everybody can't lend abroad as the, the Norwegians do, uh, the Germans do. You see the Germans, what you, uh, the Azerbaijan, they're all over there desperate for places to invest. They looked, I talked to some of them and they said, they looked at Ukraine and said, no way. <laughs> Uh, I guess they lent a lot to Greece, and that was, turned out to be a, not a good investment. Um, so you got to want to increase the places to, well, the time and consistency problem again. One way to provide more savings opportunity, if government could commit to honor its promises, which it can't, it hasn't been able to, is to issue more government debt then there is the savings opportunities. But inevitably, when there is a lot of government debt, the, the politics come in and becomes redistributional game, and the people that saved lose to the, gets shifted to the people who didn't save. Um, so therefore, the people will not lend. Uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt have a nice book that sort of documents so many historical examples of default, explicit or hidden, or partial default on government debt. There's a limited amount of government debt you can have, because Japan is the biggest one, 2.2 GMPs, uh, but a lot of that is held by the in government trust accounts. Let me ask you just, um, just, just to finish off. Um, very interesting question. Of, this is kind of like a recent thing, but I but I read a, a little bit about your your, your comments um, on this issue. Um, very very recently, there seems to be some sort of uh, maybe the press is the one who's bringing it up, but, but there's been some sort of an issue of uh, a dilemma between the view that the the chairman of the Federal Reserve has right now and Paul Krugman. <laughs> uh, Krugman never uh, gives a well-reasoned argument. Well, that's the thing. So, they, they, they just laugh. He doesn't dare show up at the seminar at Princeton, a macro seminar where there's some bright young people in the class. They'd okay. laugh him out of the room. Because Paul Krugman is, uh, is, is being very uh, a big advocate of increasing uh, fiscal stimulus in the U.S. Um, and he's also been very a uh, big advocate of the Federal Reserve uh, increasing its uh, inflation target. Um, but there's been a lot of criticism of, of his of his. He views. has no model. He knows he's contributed nothing to macroeconomics. His field is static mm -hmm. trade. And we're talking about dynamic problems. Okay. Trade is important, and that's an exciting area of economics and they're making so much progress there. Um, 
it's tied in with the openness the, that's sort of moved to center stage in the economics profession at the, the brightest and best young people. I see you're in a uh, very big opposition on, on his uh, On the economics. trade, yeah. There's, but, <laughs> but even there, they have problems. There appears to be there's huge gains from openness and tr trade. Jeffrey Sachs uh, has a, I forget who his co-author was, has a nice documentation of the association, statistical association between uh, openness and catching up, and not open, not catching up. Um, so that's a, um, yeah, let's see, I'm, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, I don't, the Fed can't, just can't, it's one of this, what should be done, um, you've got to get the new technology and new ideas and new ways to do things, and that's got to flow. The multinationals are so important. Um, we have a lot of multinationals in the United States. There's a lot of the steel in the U.S. is produced by the Brazilian companies, cement by the Mexican companies, uh, automobiles by the Korean, Jap Japanese, and German companies. Uh, it's, we learned a lot on the technology. Most of the value added is in the U.S. The people in the, when Toyota came in there with the, in Kentucky in 19, I believe it was 84, where they were, they, limp, they had voluntary quotas on imports, so they couldn't import more. The people down there in Kentucky, Kentucky, that's a hillbilly state. It's far from the industrial heartland of the U.S. They set up that Toyota factory, and people in Kentucky really wanted that uh, uh, factory there to build there, the suppliers, the employment. Uh, and so that was a spectacular success, and cars in the U.S. got a lot better, a little competition. The American producers improved their products significantly. So that, the competition is the key. And, and Colombia should be economic, heavily integrated with its neighboring countries. Uh, well, I'm not sure about Venezuela. They shut off trade <laughs> overnight. That's not a good policy with Colombia many years ago, or not many, a number of years. Oh, yeah, it's, it's about States. time that uh, the U.S. went along with that. That was an embarrassment for the U.S. <laughs> not doing that a lot sooner. Um, that's good for the U.S., and that, I think, and good for Colombia, mutually beneficial. Um, and transportation costs have come down a lot, and that interaction, interaction of people, and there's so many ways that things, people, a lot of different people are figuring out how to improve upon. Uh, you see the new products coming along. The problem is I have to keep learning the new technologies and the new product uh, that are changing so fast. Uh, so actually, I mean, in that respect, it means that, you know, the, the openness that Colombia is also gaining with the world, and especially with the free trade agreement with the United States, um, I believe from what you're saying is that um, it's actually opening up also Colombia for new technology, which is... Opening up the multinationals coming in here. Colombia should develop their multinationals. I'm not... I know Brazil they has are, and our are. thing. And, um, in setting up operations abroad, mm -hmm. then it's, it sustains the cooperative, cooperative arrangement. You, if, you, if a country tries to do closed policies, then they have, there's a special interest group that have a vested interest in staying open in, in the country, and they sort of block that, and, that's, and the cooperation continues. Uh, and I think it's, Colombia should be sovereign fi fiscally, and I think the European countries should say sovereign fiscally, and let each market 
each country be judged by the market on um, whether or not they're, and if they start playing games with accounting or something else, uh, there's some people who will inspect that and see the, see a, well, I'm, I'm not, it'll get reflected in the market. The market is a, a good evaluator the value of device. People are putting their money where their mouth is. Where their, so you have to be careful there. And there's, but as soon as you have some other third party bailing out, that, then it gets messed up. Thank you very much for your time. Okay.